What is up, folks? My name is Justin Kana, and you are listening to slash watching the read-through of my 2022 playbook. I have it up on the screen right now, and this is something that I write every single year, and the reason that I record it is so that it can kind of be like if you've ever had those audiobooks where the author reads it, and then they intersperse some additional context into the words that they've written and want to share. And that's more or less what I'm seeking to do today, because this is something that I just finished up writing. It's kind of fresh in my mind, and I want to go through each of the individual points and then potentially, uh, obviously, release this on audio if any of these pieces end up being helpful. And then same thing on YouTube, uh, and links for everything that I talk about are, of course, down below, and the entire piece is also available. That's probably how we're going to do this. We'll link the entire piece, and if you happen to stumble upon a point that you enjoyed or want to do a little bit more digging on, just go ahead and find that in the article. And so, this is one of the first years where I consider 2021's playbook required reading. This is one of those where 55, I, I did a, a tally, I counted 55 of the lessons and tactics and practices that I shared in that edition. And then I tallied them up and I said, which ones aren't I still doing? Which ones am I not doing anymore? And I'm still doing 85 plus percent of them. And so instead, in, in lieu of just telling you, just go read 2021s, there are things that have changed from that year to this year. But, you know, keep that in mind as we're talking about this. Don't think that this is just exactly what I'm doing. I'm maintaining a lot of what I did in 2021 this year. And so the biggest kind of tagline that I'm, I have two taglines for 2022. The first one is explore versus exploit. And if you're not familiar with that aphorism, I will share a little bit about it. And so what I share is all the years leading up to 2021, whether it's my career or how I approach life in general, I was bouncing around. I was experimenting. I was what the person who kind of coined this phrase calls exploring the map, similar in a video game. I was doing new workouts all the time. I was finding new places to live all the time, new projects to work on. And I had just new people in my life all the time. And this past year, 2021, was the first year of coming to terms with what they call exploiting. So this is once you've found a place on the map where there are resources or whatever, you exploit that. You stop exploring because the opportunity cost of leaving what you've just found is, is a net negative. And so the framework that is often shared is this explore versus exploit framework. And when you're new to a place or untethered to any specific commitment, it makes sense to explore because you don't quite have what you need yet. And so in lieu, instead of just sitting there and spinning your wheels on something that's not working, it makes sense for you to continue to see what the other options are. And I shared this in my conversation with Kendall Beach when I discussed that when I moved to Seattle, what I did was I created a portfolio of opportunities, similar to how like a VC or an investor creates multiple bets, assuming that one of them will pay off not necessarily putting all the chips into one corner because that is silly. <laughs> and especially if you have the deal flow structure where you can get multiple opportunities, why not spread the, spread the load a little bit? However, it's easy to get caught up in the constantly changing and novel nature of exploration because everything's new all the time, where you end up doing what David Perel calls hugging the X axis. And he has a great piece that I've linked up in the playbook where you can read this if you want. Basically sharing, if you think about a graph, there's the horizontal x-axis, and you never get to the, the hockey stick. You never get to the exponential launching point because you're always falling back down to the x-axis when you're exploring. And my experience in 2021 was learning the value of deploying an exploit mentality and how it can lead to the achievement of nearly all the goals that I've set for myself. And so... It's hard to get out of that state of explorer mindset because that's been the status quo for me for the past however many years this is, 10 years, 12 years at least. This is the first time in a decade that I've thought about exploiting. And so 2022 is a fitting year to adopt the theme of double down. Two, two, double down. There's three twos in 2022. So these are my kind of frame of mind reference points. More of what works. Play to my strengths push more chips into practices and projects and relationships that are providing value to me and moving that needle. And then also, and I'm going to share this in the work section, set non-arbitrary targets that relate to them too, non-intangibles. like intangibles. 
And you'll find dot points for each category for the things that have changed. Um, if things have changed at all, not, not very many things have, but for all intents and purposes, assume that you can overlap 2021's playbook on top of this and kind of have it at 50% transparency so you can see both at the same time to see the full picture. So first category is health. And the long story short is I'm in the best shape of my life right now, hands down. I have never felt stronger, more flexible, more full of energy every day when I wake up than this year. And I give credit to the great habits that I basically built in 2020 and 2021. However, notice that there are a few minor tweaks that I'm hoping to improve, and I just feel an immense sense of gratitude that these are the only things that come to mind when I think about my health. I know that uh, some of us have family members or people in our lives who don't take care of their health, and when I made the change and told myself that I was going to make health a priority, it was something that was quite boring. It was something that it was not something that I was, I didn't set myself, oh, well, you're going to run a marathon, you're going to compete in this, you're going to whatever. I just told myself, I kind of need to take care of my health. And so doing a little bit of research into what are some best practices and find things that are semi addicting for me to do. And I ultimately found things that work. And I'm just grateful that I am in this place. So first point is injury prevention. I had two injury scares in 2021 on the right side of my upper neck, kind of in my trap area, and on my left knee also, because I was trying to really put up some big squat numbers, and I think that affected both my right up, upper right neck, my trap, and my left knee at the same time. And I just had a rethink about how I think about strength and overall numbers and goals that I set for myself, especially understanding like the build that I have as a human. And Chris Williamson, who has a podcast that I listen to quite frequently called Modern Wisdom, has this idea that he talks about, which is fitness menopause, which is when you achieve a lot of arbitrary strength goals after lifting in the traditional bro split or, you know, any any sort of kind of gym rat style programming for a long time. And you have that strength, you have those goals met, but you can't bend over to tie your shoes or you can't end up uh, walking up a flight of stairs without tweaking your hamstring or something like that. And so I've, I've basically changed a couple of things when it comes to, to fitness. The first being adopting a warm-up routine through a combination of exercises that feel good to me and basically weird stretches that I see Peter Atia do on Instagram because he has a phenomenal physical therapy routine that he does to keep himself in great shape. He's about 20 years older than I am, I'm thinking, guessing. And so for whatever he does... Then I think that there's a combination of being able to take away certain insights from that and bring it into my routine. So what this looks like is, you know, a lot of boring stuff, arm circles, walking, hamstring exercises, hip mobility, all of that stuff happens before I put any strenuous weight on a bar. And speaking of weight, the big number lifting is less top of mind for me this year. Basically, the thing that I want to push for is progressive overload week after week and let that compounding of that and the consistency of that take over because I would have weeks where, again, talking about big numbers, I would, I would try to do a 300 pound squat and then two days later I would feel this twang in the top of my right neck area and I would be like, okay, well, can't lift for 10 days. You know, like don't, I, I would just be so demotivated to go back to the gym and throw up big numbers because I was like, I don't want to feel that again can barely sit on a Zoom meeting and pay attention because I'm in so much pain. I just end up on the couch, like, trying to scroll Instagram because I, I can't sit and type at a keyboard. And so those those are obviously things that I just think are super important. And warming up, as boring as it sounds, and it's like, oh, you loser, what are you doing, warming up? It's like, no, actually, that's what is going to continue to catapult my strength goals uh, to where I want them to be. So... I did hit a 400 pound, 405 pound deadlift in 2021. There's a great photo that I posted on the 8020 Edge newsletter on that, and it felt really good. And I was actually quite shocked at how it felt to lift that much weight. Uh, however, I do share in the playbook that I fell short on both my squat and my bench press goals. My bench press, believe it or not, we're two weeks into 2022, and I think I should be able to hit 225 next by next week. I'm incredibly close like it's it's two plates are in my future and so i'm very very excited for that so that's on the injury prevention side and a little bit of sharing on how my numbers did 
The next point is range of motion, and I also didn't achieve the two mobility goals that I set out to reach in 2021. And those are the two that I put into my tracker, not necessarily the ones that I mentioned in the playbook. The It's mostly related to my hamstring, hamstrings, which still remain tight and weak. So to solve for that, I miss executing my evening routine by a staggering amount every week. And that's effectively the time that I set aside every day to hopefully get some hamstring stretching in. There's a whole thing that I share in 2021 about how I use Tom Merrick's mobility routines during that time. And so what I've done to combat that is set a, on my phone, on any Apple device, Apple Reminders has the ability to just show on your home screen when a task is not completed. And I keep notifications for almost everything turned off. And so seeing a notification really drives me mad. And so for my morning routine and my evening routine, I have an Apple Reminder that goes off and it seeks it i've hacked it so that the the routines the stretching routines are no more than one click away once i open it and so that makes it so that i'm much more likely to do my stretching in the evening because i want the notification to go away and i've made it very low friction to get to the routine and then also because we have a new place there's like more space for me to roll out a yoga mat and actually get some stretching done and so the two goals that i have that i'm going to continue to work for is being able to touch my toes and to be able to do down dog the yoga pose with my heels touching the ground those are the two and they're again they're both very hamstring related because those are super tight and the other one that uh, i i don't think i mentioned is doing jefferson curls and so those are weighted kind of like bend down vertebrae, vertebrae, vertebrae by vertebrae. That's difficult to say. And touch your toes with weight. So currently I'm doing it with about 40, 50 pounds in my hand and trying to get strength down in that strength, in that um, stretched uh, range of motion is what's going to be important. And the last thing I share, the progressive overload goals from above I will be strengthening all of the supportive muscles for that on my corrective day in the gym. So I do one corrective day over the gym in the gym, uh, and that leads to more confidence in those stretch positions. So on my corrective day, I do the um, Jefferson curls. I also do Hugh Jackman's rowing challenge. It's not even a challenge. It's just what he does in his day-to-day -day life. And so it's 2,000 meters in seven minutes. And the closest, the, the time I got last week was 1,578 meters. So I'm about 400 meters away from the goal in the time frame that he has shared. And so that just needs to come over time. All right, last piece on health. I talk about cardiovascular health, and I'm going to be very frank with you folks. I'm nervous about my heart. The There's a history of bad hearts in my family. When I look at what my aura ring tells me about my HRV, my heart rate variability numbers, it's staggeringly low. And I know that everybody's number is different, but I can't seem to pin down why my HRV is so low. I, But what I'm going to try to do to experiment combating it is that I don't do a lot of cardiovascular training. I do a lot of lifting. I play tennis, but even then, it's like my heart rate really isn't up that high. Um, it's not like I'm pl not playing intensely. I just don't, it doesn't compare to like going for a run or being on a bike for a long time. And so what I'm experimenting with is doing what's called zone two training, where you keep your heart rate at a level where you can still have a conversation with someone if they were next to you on the treadmill or walking next to you. And I, because I don't want too much taxing stress on my heart, I basically want to just improve its strength overall and just see what happens there. Because I think that if I can stress my heart out in a, in a sustainable way, I think that might make the muscle itself stronger. And we'll have to just see how that ends up going, going because I don't notice any other sort of numbers with like, I don't drink all that often. Uh, I don't stress out uh, about things all like I know people in my life who are way more stressed about things and I just don't think that I compare with them. Maybe I do. I meditate for 20 minutes still every single morning and I just find it hard to believe that that is the problem. And so again, cardiovascular health, it's one of those things where I have a bad history of heart health in my family. I'm not paranoid that I'm going to have a heart attack or something like that, but I will be sitting at my desk and I'll randomly notice that my heart is like fluttering really, really quickly and then it stops. 
and I don't exactly know what that means. Same thing with like when I take my dad to doctor's appointments, they say that his heart has like murmurs and stuff like that. So I'm keeping an eye on it is what I'm saying. I don't think that I'm about to drop dead anytime soon. But as I think about, I shared it in the start of this section, I'm very grateful to not have a lot of health problems. And so I can be nitpicky about the things that I do think are either cause for alarm or things that I just want to keep an eye on. So that is the health section. Moving on, let's talk about wealth. So here, again, 2020 and 2021 deserve a massive round of applause for instilling these rock-solid habits that are continuing to just slowly compound for me over time. So happy to report my net worth increased more than it ever has in 2021, and I plan to basically continue the trend this year with a couple of additional boosts to that practice. And so the first one is a house purchase. So my wife and I bought a house in 2021. And I shared it in a recent Ask JK video that we're moving. I didn't share that it was a house. Now that we're in it, I can share that it is a house. We've been renters for our entire adult lives, and it's incredibly connected to this double down theme of this year with this decision that we've made, and it's kind of expressing itself in a commitment to a physical location here in Seattle. And it coincided at the same time of us craving more space, we got more savvy with our financial moves, and we were able to get a great interest rate on a mid-century house here in Seattle. And we will plan to continue to invest in this property. It's going to be a priority for us this year, and it's effectively an additional diversification category of of wealth accumulation that's new for us. We're learning a lot about what it's like to own property and all of the additional expenses that go along with that, but also a lot of the upsides that go with it. And again, I share in the playbook that it's not to say that being a homeowner has been lollipops and puppies. We've spent a ridiculous amount on a unexpected bathroom remodel that we had to do no more than six weeks after we moved in. And we also, of course, have to do all the other things like uh, spend on additional furniture to outfit the increased square footage that we have. However, in the long term, we see this being a great place to establish roots for ourselves. And I'm going to share a little bit more in the family section uh, later on in the playbook. Crypto and Web3 comes next, and as I'm going to share in the work section coming up, my income suffered in 2021, even though I say my net worth went up, but that prevented me from having as much investing behavior as I had in 2019 and 2020. However, what I've shared a lot of, I've, I've spent basically a lot of time researching and ex- educating myself on the opportunities that lie ahead in the crypto and Web3 space, and it's becoming more obvious than ever that Web3, whether you call it the metaverse or not, it's going to fundamentally change how we live our lives. And I'm planning to keep crypto as a large bucket kind of in my mind as kind of future investment goals, categories, and places that I invest in. And where does this come from? It comes from the trend line that you see in a couple of different areas and sectors, remote work, gaming, um, huge, uh, frustrated population of people that are unbanked. And if you've ever gotten paid in crypto or done a transaction in crypto or had digital ownership yet, I think that's what really kind of like flips a switch for you. And you're like, oh, everything else seems so antiquated. And that's ultimately what kind of makes me, I'm, I'm, I'm learning and I'm pr- being a, trying to be a practitioner. And I'm also trying to just keep an open mind and not push all of the chips into this new asset class and category, but also like I regret a lot of not being a little bit more savvy with a couple of other digital platforms early on in their lifetime. And as new things come up and opportunities present themselves, like don't, you have to be a bit of a contrarian in, in some of the, like that's where the opportunity comes buying real estate in an area that previously doesn't have anything developed in it is a contrarian move. But if you're right, you are the one that gets the disproportionate returns on that decision. And so being a little bit of a contrarian now, I I have a great, I I consider it a great little monologue I did on a recent 8020 Edge newsletter, where I talk about how chefs can actually benefit from Web3 immediately, even without being a market participant. So Next point that I have is called Cash Machine. That's a little headline that I have. And 
it comes from me doing what I'm calling a disgusting amount of reading and research and listening. And after doing a lot of that external research and a lot of internal reflection on myself, I'm effectively convinced that my 30s should be spent building businesses. And since I don't have a multi-million dollar fortune to start with, the quickest route to attaining deployable amounts of capital for the goals that I have is to invest in early stage food and media startups someday. And that needs to come from a high cash flow generating business. So it's like if I want money to invest, I need to create something that generates cash flow. And simultaneously, if I want to make good investing decisions, I also cannot be in a business 40 to 50 to 60 hours a week when I have that cash flow going. Does that make sense? So it's difficult to articulate when someone says, oh, why don't you want a restaurant? You're a really talented chef. It's like that doesn't map because sure, maybe I could get cash flow going, but if I'm the face of that restaurant and I have to be in service every single week, that's not interesting to me because then I can't make any of these sort of other decisions. I'm also tied to a physical location. It's a bunch of downsides to owning a restaurant and it's just not as interesting as potentially other things that I could build understanding my skill set. And I'm going to talk about that in the work section really quickly. Um, I have also turned the corner of thinking that being a frivolous creator who just makes stuff on the internet is the only way. I plan on taking lessons from what others have built from large media and brand legacies and using those principles to create my own path. I talk about this in the work section. Uh, Just my overall confidence of what I'm capable of in business has grown quite a bit this year. So... I do have a mini retirement experiment below um, because what that shares is, and I'll get into it in a second, is that I know now what it feels like to have my needs met and have disposable time, but I don't have a lot of disposable income. And that lifestyle I've determined is more for 40-year-old Justin. And so until then, I would prefer to keep my needs met but have less disposable time in exchange for cash flow that I can use to invest if that makes sense. Think a little bit more. There's a time-tested piece of, of advice that goes less time in the business and more time on the business. Because when you do that, you can extricate yourself in a more productive way at any point in time. It doesn't necessarily have to be just when the business sells or something like that. All right, let's talk about family before we talk about work. This one is short. It's weird because in 2021's playbook, I say that we would start to see the family category become a larger category of these playbooks. I think I've kind of flipped the script on that, thinking that it's going to become a larger priority in my life. However, as the audience and the following grows, I'm taking a lot of inspiration from other large public figures on how they publicize their family lives. Not saying I'm going to be as big as these people, but there's a reason that they behave the way that they behave, right? So Gary V has family first in his Twitter bio, but he never posts pictures of his wife and kids on Instagram or on Twitter. Why is that? Tim Ferriss shares that his girlfriend is one of the most important people in his life, but he still hasn't mentioned her by name on any of his content. Why is that? I don't think this is a coincidence. I'm not trying to get tinfoil hatty. It's just the fact of the matter is scary behavior like doxing and threats to family members becomes a really easy button for people to press online these days. And I just don't want any of that. And so what that does is, unfortunately, creates... This weird discrepancy when I write these pieces, because I say family is a priority, but there's not a lot of words that I write about family. And, you know, where my plans lie and what I'm able to share don't always match in their level of detail. And so to combat that while still providing some value to you, the listener, this marks the year of dot points on family that I'm going to start sharing. So first dot point is to read Tim Urban's The Tail End. It's a fantastic piece on his blog, Wait But Why. It's linked up. And if nothing else, this quote that I pulled out sums up why I really value having my dad about 30 minutes away from us here in Seattle. Quote, living in the same place as the people you you love matters. I probably have 10 times the time left with the people who live in my city as I do with the people who live somewhere else. End quote. 
Next dot point is going to therapy with your partner or spouse is a life hack. And my wife and I go three to four times a year now. We did some stuff with the therapist that was before we got married, and now we're continuing that relationship. And it's just immensely deepened the understanding that we have into ourselves, into each other, and how each of us contributes to the dynamic in the relationship. And I couldn't be a bigger proponent of it. Just everybody should do it. Next stop point is I created a checklist that I do once per week where I send a message to family members that I want to keep in touch with. And the staggering numbers that I put behind this is that even if I only do it 50% of the time, so there's 52 weeks in a year, even if I only do it 26 times a year, that's 10 times as many texts as I would have sent if I would have just texted these family members on birthdays and holidays, right? 26 times at 50% hit rate versus just two to three. And nine times out of 10, when I send these messages, it's just a silly four to five message exchange. How are you doing? What's up? Blah, 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 blah. But the times when it really actually does turn into like a FaceTime call or they give me a really important update or I get to update them on something, it just makes me really happy that I did it. And so if you're trying to take takeaways, find a way to create a checklist for yourself in something that you do once a week anyways. So like if you go to the grocery store, maybe you like stop yourself in the parking lot of the grocery store and go through that checklist and just text some people in your life that you want to reconnect with. It could potentially help. I became an uncle this year. Our new little nephew is cute as can be, and we're just really excited to spoil him and teach him about fun foods soon. The next stop point is I didn't grow up in a house that was warm and welcoming, at least by traditional standards. And I share that we weren't in poverty, but that there was never a sense of enjoying having people over at our house growing up. And it's hard to believe that that didn't influence me into going into hospitality. And so now that I have a house of my own with my wife, I'm just really excited to host get-togethers with friends and be a place that family can come when they come to visit Seattle. I, I, I want to be the opposite of that. I have an immense... I don't have a large desire for like material things. I have a better sense of what I want is the ability to have what I didn't have growing up, which is like, Naval calls it like a house full of love, basically, is kind of what I'm going for. And last dot point is still no kids on the books for us for this year. So those are my dot points on family. Let's talk about work. This is probably the most, I'm going to call it like in-depth piece and the, 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 the place where I'm the most comfortable being transparent and vulnerable. And the biggest theme in my work this year was getting over myself. As I've shared in previous years, I am absolutely my own worst critic. I think a lot of my friends actually joke that I'm too focused on personal development when I post that I have increased my typing speed or something funny. And it's one of the reasons that I was so comfortable when I initially started the podcast and the YouTube channel. No one was going to be hard. There was no comment anybody could leave that would be worse than how I feel about my f first draft, my V1 kind of thing, you know? And as the following grew, as the audience got bigger, I developed this immense imposter syndrome. And I would fear comments that would call me a fraud. And those comments never got shared. They, nobody posted that ever. And even if they did, like, looking back, I can say, like, who cares? Who cares if they comment that? Those negative comments never come from people who are actually, you know, quote unquote, successful or happy or have any sense of peace. And so I simultaneously, I, I started to harbor this weird sense that what makes me different, what I've spent the past five years of my career on is a disadvantage somehow. And because, because think about it, right? I'm not a chef with a restaurant empire, nor am I a content creator with millions of followers. I'm somewhere in the middle. I'm not an entrepreneur with an eight-figure net worth, but I'm also not a starving artist with like one-of-one one original pieces. I'm somewhere in the middle. And so what's going to change in 2022 for me is looking at the fact that I can empathize with both as the superpower. That's, that's the thing. So it's like, stop thinking that you need to be one or the other. You fall somewhere in between. And so trust that. Trust the process and understand that there are plenty of multi-hyphenates out there that have made incredible careers out of their extraordinary mix of talents. 
And I need to remind myself of that. So examples that I give in the playbook is like Rick Rubin, who's like a producer who just like, he just produces hit after hit after hit, but he's like, he's not the music, he's not the one playing the guitar. I think about like Josh Waitskin going from like chess to kite sur uh, surfing or whatever he does. Logic is a great example where he's like rapper and then he's a gamer and now he's an author. Anyone you read about in the the book that David Epstein has called Range, any of those examples is like, don't be a specialist, be a generalist. And what I ultimately have to tell myself and remind myself of is that it comes down to conviction and decision making if you've identified you're good at multiple things. Because otherwise you fall into that trap of, it's like, if a dog has two owners, it's going to die because none of them will remember to feed the dog. Or the other example is, like, the donkey that um, has to choose between hay and water should just choose one and then go to the next thing, otherwise it will die. The plan is to act on those strengths that I have, again, double down, and not apologize for it. I, I, I think I get into this trap where I think that someone's going to comment, you call yourself a chef, but you don't have a restaurant. Or you call yourself a YouTuber, but your quality isn't that, that good, or something like that. And, and the fact of the matter is, one, again, those comments have yet to come, number one. And number two, I am the only person, I, like I've created a category and it's really lonely in that category. And so understanding that you have chosen to create this, and the best thing you can do is lean into the fact that this is what makes you unique versus trying to be more like the status quo, I'm constantly fighting that. And so keeping that top of mind is something that I'm you know, really trying to lean into this year. All right, let's talk about Voyager Stable. I have transitioned from co-founder in Voyager's Table to a board member of Voyager's Table. So I'm not in the day-to-day -day business anymore. And that comes from the fact that the events sector, Voyager's Table is my event production company. And events as an industry was hit just as hard as any of the other industries over the past 20 months of the pandemic. And it was the most challenging set of business scenarios I've ever had to navigate. How are we going to make payroll? How are we going to think about renewing our lease in our office? What about all this inventory that we have? What do we tell our clients? What do we tell our team? All these sorts of things. In addition to those changes that we've been navigating, like the work itself changed. We were no longer hosting intimate or creative private dinners for clients. Everything moved online. And at the same time, I was working really hard on the course and not and I, I wanted to get back on the horse of the U, of the YouTube channel and the podcast. I had in navigating all of that, everything kind of fell by the wayside. I think a lot of you even have left me comments that like you stopped seeing my videos in your feed, period. And after too many nights and weekends spent working on the Justin Kana stuff, I would notice that I was spending Voyager's table time just like not focused at all. And I'm so incredibly lucky to have a business partner in Jade that I was able to have the hard conversation with that ultimately resulted in the decision that we both made together for me to become an advising and strategic member of the company, no longer involved as I shared in, in the day-to-day -day operations anymore. And what this does is it allows the company to rebrand from not being such a catering-focused company. So because I was a co-founder and a chef, everybody was like, oh, well, you're a food company. And it's like, yeah, kind of, but like we do more than that. Like we, we do more event production stuff. And, and so that helps that we can kind of move the company's direction in a more focused way. But it also allows me to gain experience in advising and being a productive board member of a growing company. I've never done that before. And so this is really cool for me to support the CEO, um, ask hard hitting questions, uh, be supportive and bring my network in and just all of those things. It's, it's something I'm excited about and I'm just, there, there was no, you know, punches swung and no like immense lawsuits or legal, like nothing ha like it, it was, it was the cleanest transition I could have asked for. And I'm just happy that that was exactly kind of what happened. So, Next up, there. this is a fascinating piece. This is a mini retirement experiment that I did. 
And at the start of 2021, I it was probably two months in to 2021, I diverted from the playbook. I got a couple of weeks into thinking that that was exactly what I was going to do for the year. I wrote it, I published it, and I called an audible and I tried something. And this is the first time that I'm publicly sharing that I tried this. So what happened? I had fallen off of the train of weekly uploading to YouTube. I was focusing on the business. I basically didn't think that I, I didn't want to create knife review videos when the industry was so in shambles, right? Like, what am I going to do? Tell you to go buy a knife when a lot of people just lost their job? Like, that's silly. Also, dinners weren't happening because people weren't vaccinated yet at the start of 2021. And Voyager's Table as a business, because we were doing a lot of events online, it needed very little input from me. And I was effectively, from the time that I was spending at Voyager's Table and a couple of the other projects I was doing, I was making about $2,000 a month, which at that number and at my current lifestyle, that allowed me to pay rent, that allowed me to cover my other expenses, and then I could still put $500 towards a retirement account. It was the only three rules I had, pay my bills and save for retirement. And so I asked myself after a couple weeks of that happening, I was like, what would it look like if you were to find contentment in this, this life? And that question became, be, be, started, it was the genesis of a three to four month experiment of me not pursuing any other projects. And so basically I did what I wanted to do. I hosted more podcast interviews than I ever have. I would stay home and I would read a lot. I would go to the gym four to five times a week. I played some video games on Switch and I watched a bunch of YouTube. And I ended up in a really weird place because all of my quote unquote needs were met financially and I had achieved what a lot of people envy. Effectively, I had an eight hour work week, even though I'm calling it like a mini retirement. I only worked about eight hours a week. And I had no overhead. I had time to do whatever I wanted. And I was executing on projects that were truly my own. Nobody else hosts the podcast. It's my podcast. However, when I talk about ending up in a weird place, all I found there was guilt. I felt a lot of shame. And I really lost like my zest for life. Because I wasn't able to connect with anybody else in my age group. Being able to talk to someone and say, like, what are you working on? I would just, I would, I would try to play it up. I'd be like, oh, well, I'm working on the podcast. I'm writing this course, blah, 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 blah. I couldn't tell anyone that, like, hey, I'm trying to, like, the, I'm, I'm, like, reti- quote, unquote, retired right now. It felt super weird. And I, I obviously don't want to tell anybody else that, like, because I'm also simultaneously saying, like, oh, well, you should push to progress your career. Meanwhile, I've, like, taken a pause Again, this goes back to like my imposter syndrome thing. And so that fizzled out and I kind of like, I, I, I got to, again, I descended into this weird place and I stopped and I was like, okay. And now looking back, reflecting this experiment onto my core values, which again, if nobody has done Taylor Pearson's core values exercise, you absolutely need to. I realized that nearly all of my core values was being underserved when I was running this mini retirement experiment. So for those that don't know, my core values are persistence, humor, adventure, contribution, connection, and velocity. And so the first one is, with persistence, I gave up on striving for anything. And so with no nothing pushing back against me, there was no point in feeling persistent. There was nothing to pe- feel persistent of. So humor... Sure, I had no employees and very little customers to deal with. That might be like the joy of some people. But I also had no one to joke around with or have inside jokes with, which was very unfortunate. So with adventure, COVID absolutely contributed to me experimenting with retirement and being stuck at home. I think a lot of people either lost their jobs or their hours got reduced or something. But there wasn't even enough disposable income to spend on an adventure. So there was no feeling of adventure in my life. Also contribution. There was the the podcast episodes that I did publish during that time. Sure, they contributed in their own way if they helped people. However, I didn't have a team to lead. I didn't have a big project to share. 
And it was difficult to feel like I was being a productive member of society. I think that's ultimately what got me. I was like, sure, you're quote unquote experimenting with retirement at 29 years old, but like you're not doing anything, you know, like that felt so unproductive to me. And I know product productivity is not like it, it's kind of a useless means to an end, but I just hated that feeling. I just really, really ugh. connection was second to last. And this was probably the one that maintained itself. I got to I got to spend way more time with my dad than I usually than I probably would have. I was home for dinner every night with my wife. I called my mom twice a week. I would get out in nature a little bit more. Like there was a lot of good connection that came from this experiment, but this is one of six core values that I have. And then the last piece is velocity, and this is probably the one that hurt the most because with a huge decrease in quote unquote speed and zero clear direction for where I was going, I was just adrift in this retirement thing, velocity went negative for me because I had no direction and I had very little speed. So I'm calling that like a huge failure in velocity. And so because I've been able to execute on that experiment and get that, scratch that itch, get that out of my system, I'm bringing a whole found new appreciation for work into 2022 that I've never, ever, ever had before. There's an entrepreneur named Alex Hormozzi who is going on a big rant right now and he's getting some traction around the fact that like passive income, quote unquote, that people always talk about as the goal is actually this really unfulfilling place to get to where you're making money but you have nothing to do like you don't feel like you're contributing to anything and having again having scratched the itch of not needing to work in my own way a way that works for me there's no sense of dread or apprehension towards new projects or personal accountability anymore. That's the only thing that I want is exciting projects, speed, things that I take responsibility for. Like I want to put a team on my back kind of thing. And I'm just excited to put out ridiculous, ridiculously high quality work for the audience that's been so good to me over the past several years. That's you folks. And just get as many new people into the fold as possible. So what does that mean? To start off, I want to be a content creator full time. This is the year when I make creating on the internet a full time commitment. So YouTube is the place where I plan to start because the audience is already there and it provides the quickest path to reasonable, consistent revenue for myself. However, I'm unfortunately starting a bit on the back foot. And why is that? In 2021, I shot the channel in the foot. Because I told myself, well, it's okay that you're not uploading the normal videos. Just do more podcast episodes. You'll still upload multiple times a week. It's going to be great. What that did was, because it didn't match with a lot of the other videos that got a lot of views on the channel, it confused the hell out of the algorithm. And so the view counts that we're getting on the channel right now aren't nearly as high as they used to be. And so we have to do a little bit of rehab and repair on the channel itself. And so to combat this, I'm bringing back a lot of the old favorites that the channel had in 2018, 2019. And you folks might have noticed it already. There's new TPC episodes, uh, knife review videos are coming back, and there's, of course, more to come. I'm not going to be the YouTuber that promises things. I'd rather just show you when, it, when it's ready. And so the way that we're approaching this growth in all content platforms and just for the brand itself for what we do is trying to be sustainable about it, but also be practical. So what does that mean? We pick three platforms to grow at a time. And what we do is we set primary and secondary metrics that we're going to keep track of for those platforms that have clear, tangible numbers behind them. These either come from analytics dashboards. These might be calculated manually, but we set them. Then for each of those three platforms, we set intangibles. So things that can't be shown on a dashboard. Ali Abdal talks about he wants to publish the highest quality video, uh, the highest quality video that helps the most people possible. It's very arbitrary. It's very subjective. Some people talk about like, I want to be proud of the work that I put out. You can't calculate pride. And so it's like, we, we've set those intangibles for each of the three platforms. Um, because I want to prioritize fulfillment and satisfaction a little bit of pride. I just don't want to be a slave to the numbers. Everybody that burns out on YouTube talks about being a slave to the algorithm or being too obsessed with the numbers. So to combat that, 
we set some intangibles. And then my little production team and I meet once per month to set clear projects that track towards those goals. And then we reverse engineer the tasks that are needed to get us there. And that's our one most important meeting of the month. So we're also focusing on a cohort-based course. So the Demi Skills course that I shared in 2021, I did a full beta cohort of that. And I enjoyed every single minute of it from the content and the writing and forcing myself to structure the lessons that I learned over the years in all of these high caliber kitchens to working with an assistant to create the slides. That was really fun. I had real students that paid for the product that I created, creating landing pages, email optimizations. It was the first real quote unquote product that I had created and sold online ever. And that was phenomenal. Just such a crazy feeling. And it's it's going to be the bottom of my funnel for 2022. So the goal is to use the content from the podcast and on YouTube and all other platforms to provide value to as many people as possible and hone in on that audience that I think might be a good student for the cohort, uh, for the course. Because now I finally have an end of the rainbow. Think about the last five years for me. It was free stuff, free stuff, free stuff, and nothing to offer. Now, that's fantastic if I just want to grow an audience, but again, I have such a niche targeted focus and group of people that I want to help and to serve, but there was nothing to monetize, basically. Like, previously, I proved that I could grow an audience. Now it's on me to prove that I can serve them a product that they actually want. And after seeing the comments that come in on YouTube or the DMs that you send me or just the general sentiment in the industry that culinary school isn't right for me, that goes around a lot right now, I just see a huge opportunity for professionals to progress faster than I ever did, and I want to be the one delivering that information. It's fun for me. I like teaching. So again, I'm also finally able to, because I have this product now, I'm actually able to take the learnings from entrepreneurship books and Twitter threads and the business podcasts that I listen to, and I can actually use them. I'm not just being the entrepreneur that just watches this information and consumes it. I can actually use it on something now. Because the past five years, I've felt like a lurker. I've never had the confidence to like get out on the dance floor and give it a try. All I do is watch people from my chair as a wallflower. I watch people dance, but I never try the footwork. I never put shoes on and try. And so that's also what I'm really excited about with this course. This project allows me to bring that to life. And additionally, if you're listening to this, reading this, watching this, there is a free to take five day kitchen productivity challenge that we worked really hard to put together and to make sure that basically that you like my teaching style, that you resonate with the lessons, that you're in a good place to commit to enrolling in this course because it is intense. It is like one to three hours per week. You do have breakout sessions with other people. It is going to push you beyond kind of like what you're probably used to with professional development in this industry. And so if you're wanting to progress your career in 2022, it is the distillation of everything that I know about working in these environments packaged and delivered over four weeks. And so the plan is for us to host three cohorts this year. The first one is on February 7th. And the link for that is in the description of this podcast. If you're interested, I I, I couldn't be more excited to teach this. I'm just so jazzed to bring this to the world. Um, Next piece is quality work. And there's a sexy look, I'll call it, to to automated systems and having templates. And that just screams digital entrepreneur. The kind of like drop shipping, I don't have to touch it, software works for me. However, I think about this a lot. By definition, if it can be replicated by anyone, there's almost like a loss in character or a loss of influence from the creator that I'm kind of starting to distance myself from. It's like I went all the way to that side of the spectrum with fully automated, don't have to think about it, again, passive income, and then contrast that with the other environments that I've been in, which have been incredibly high touch. Every single person gets like the white glove service of a three Michelin star restaurant. And I'm kind of like, I've hit that bumper and I'm coming back somewhere in the middle. Mr. Beast, who's a large YouTuber, talks a lot about just make the best video possible 
And that's the intangible that he pushes for. And I'm coming around to that. I don't want things to be easy. I don't want templates. I don't want too much automation or software in my life. I want there to be a little bit of difficulty that gives the work character. Because it's not to say that we all, we throw every single bit of structure out the window and subject ourselves to the hardest way either. Remember, that's the other side of the spectrum where everything is high touch, handmade, handcrafted, everything. One-on-ones, you know what I mean? It's about looking at the final product as something you're proud of, not something you just churn out or you click a button and it creates itself. It's more, how can this be better even if it takes a little bit of work, a little bit of extra time, versus let's just do what we did last time. I don't want that. So this year, every project that I do is going to be approached with, how can I increase the quality of this? That's the lens I'm looking at stuff through. And I can't share, wait to share the results with you. Let's talk about podcasting. I learned a ton about podcasting in 2021. I still love doing it more than ever, actually. And I've found a way to compartmentalize it away from other projects that I work on in a way that I think is actually really healthy. Because remember, I shot my channel in the foot in 2021 by just uploading podcast episodes and no other videos. So what did we do? I had some of my favorite guests on the show last year. And the one that stands out the most is is absolutely Alex Anu. You probably know him as Alex Fresh, French Guy Cooking. And when we got the confirmation email sent from him that he was going to come on the show, man, what a rush that was. And when that happened, I instantly became addicted to, like, I want to do more of this. And even writing that, saying that, it makes me feel like I'm discounting all of the other incredible guests that I've had the pleasure of interviewing, which could not be further from the, from the truth. I have a shockingly low number of conversations that I didn't enjoy in the first 150 episodes of the show. I had a great time speaking with everybody. There was such value shared, and it made me a better conversationalist, a better question writer, a better um, content producer. And I think, that, again, there's valuable lessons to be taken away from every single episode of the podcast. However, remember my core values? There's something about trying to get a guest that's out of my league to say yes to a long-form conversation that spurs an immense sense of adventure in me, that feels like leaving the Shire and going to slay the dragon for me. And when it doesn't happen right away, when I don't get this person to say yes on the first email, I love being thoughtfully persistent. Remember, that's another core value of mine, persistent. I love being persistent to try to make that happen. And then once I get a yes, if I get a yes, it feels actually really good to connect with that person. Connection's another value of mine. And then I, when it's done, I get to contribute that interview to the world, to you folks, that provides you something va of value. So in this pursuit of getting big name, high quality guests on the podcast, I get to satisfy adventure, persistence, connection, and contribution. All four. And so with that many ticked boxes, it's a no-brainer for me to continue the show. But there's more, as I shared. I'm treating the podcast like its own separate business. So the Emulsion Podcast has its own YouTube channel. We use Simplecast to host the website, and so we just use the Simplecast website for it. I made a logo that I hand-drew myself. And we're finally accepting sponsors. And we're, again, going for bigger-named guests. And this can hopefully serve as a reminder for you if you're just starting off on a content creation journey or you're just starting a project that doesn't quite have its legs yet, that it took almost 150 episodes for me to start taking podcasting seriously. And if you're on episode 13, you got a long way to go. It took me a long time. And so, again, can you get there faster? Absolutely. But just think about, like, what's the kernel nugget of the idea that gets you excited about it? And how can it reflect onto other things that you value in this world? And just lean into that a little bit more. All right, two more sections, and then we get into hacks and favorites. So the first is community. And this is such a buzzword now on Twitter, and every startup has a Discord, and a, they're trying to build community, blah, blah, blah. 
And quite honestly, community is the least clear part of my work playbook. Because I love that there's a private, paywalled area of the internet for real fans of mine to come hang out. However, it is incredibly underserved, and I own that. Because the problem is, the folks that support and pay to be a part of the community, they don't want anything. And that's so perplexing to me. I don't, I don't get it. They just want to see me publish every week. I've done surveys. I've done one-on-ones. I've sent DMs to the community. They don't care that they don't get behind-the-scenes photos. They don't care that they don't get extra videos. They don't care about exclusive access. Sure, it's nice that when they DM me, I DM back within 24 hours. But, like, I have done the experiment of hosting weekly live streams in the community. And I still do the occasional unboxing video, but, like, nobody watches those videos. I see the view count. And that's a wild place to be as a creator, where fans support what you're already doing, and you don't have to give anything extra. Like, thank you. The folks that support the content get access to the community, but, like, they don't really need it. They just want to see more videos. However, I'm combating that, the other side of that coin is, the paradox for me is, there's a bone in me that wants to see it grow. I want to have a thriving community online. And I see a real benefit to positive, to having a positive, encouraging, and thought-provoking place to hang out online for professional chefs. Does that exist elsewhere? Sure, it might, but it's not mine. So how can I create something like that? And that, full transparency, that is not one of the three pl- platforms we're looking to grow this quarter. Quarter two, quarter three, quarter four, we might shift our focus. But for now, I'm excited to continue to learn and experiment and find conviction on an answer for that for 2022. And what I'm trying to do in all of this time is like pay attention to other communities and what works there. And then how can I take a lot of that learning combined with the fact that like when I post a video, uh, a post on YouTube that says I'm doing an Ask JK video, people comment, you folks engage, like you folks talk to me and the DMs on Instagram, you send me your stories, like there's, there's community there. It's just not centralized. Like I want to bring everything to one place and then offer the gasoline to kind of like really make it ember and and flame and just get get like there it's a no-brainer to join justin's community that's kind of what i want it to be so that's a goal it's something i want to work on it's not short term but it is going to happen in 2022 all right the last piece is leaning into strengths so in the spirit of staying true to the double down 2022 theme the advice to play to your strengths is really resonating with me a lot. And this hopefully kind of ties a bow on this whole section. Because when you work alone, you, by definition, have to do everything. And some of those things might not be what you're good at. And so I'm solving for that. I basically have a four-person team that works part-time with me as of writing this. It might be six at the end of the year. It might be down to two. I don't know, but I have an amazing production assistant who manages podcast show notes, does the episode bookings, deals with the content calendar, writes the YouTube descriptions, links all of the affiliate links, and a bunch of other behind-the-scenes tasks for me. I have a project manager who helps with sponsorship relationships, managing the workflow for the course, defining project work streams, and deals with a lot of the contract stuff. Again, this is like stuff that... Sure, I could do it, but it's like, it's not my strength. So hire for it. Like, that's the message I'm trying to get through here. And the last person is a fantastic video editor who takes the footage that I shoot and turns it into content that you see on the channel for almost 80% of what we publish. The only things I edit now are very simple talking head videos, similar to this one, and TPC episodes. Those are the only two things that I edit. Because... I can't have someone who wasn't at the table with me editing a meal. So, like, I edit TPC episodes. I don't edit gear videos. I don't edit podcasts. That's huge. Like, 2020, 2019, Justin, would have been like, no way. What do you mean you don't edit gear videos anymore? 
that took a lot of work, but we got there through a lot of like, I had to do a lot of writing. I had to do a lot of like screen sharing. I had to do a lot of like distill, write again, get better at writing. If you're struggling as an entrepreneur or as a leader, your ability to write absolutely impacts a ton of other things in yourself. And the goal of a lot of these hires is to take a lot off my plate. So the only things that I'm doing, I would love to get to the end of 2022. And the only tasks that I'm doing are the ones that I can uniquely do. There's a great entrepreneur named Anthony Pompliano who talks a lot about his goal for 2022 is identifying what is he doing that there isn't a system for. And he asks him his, his employees, he asks himself that, Am I doing things repetitively that there can be a system put in place for that somebody else can do this? And it's an age-old piece of advice, but I'm seeing the benefits and I'm truly getting to practice what I'm preaching about leadership. It's not a full-time crew yet. They're all contractors that work with me, but I'm getting to flex the I work for my team muscle because I'm the one that has to make the, the decisions. I have to create the systems and I have to operationalize our processes so that they can do their best work when they work with me on a project. And I'm getting to do that, and it is one of the most fulfilling things in the world. And I love it. So that's it for work. Last piece, this is kind of like rapid fire. These are hacks and favorites. These are just kind of things that I'm loving, things that I just really, really enjoy and, and or have picked up recently and either consume or use on a frequent basis. First piece is my aura ring. I've talked about this before. However, I lost my aura ring that I was wearing in 2021. And coincidentally, this landed three weeks before they announced the version three, which is the new one. And the timing of that could not have been better. I was going to the gym and I think I put it in my pocket. And when I pulled out my keys for my bike, because I was biking to the gym at the time, uh, the ring was hooked onto the keys and it fell down and I tried to go back and someone must have picked it up and walked off with it. But I'm a massive fan of the new version. I love that the battery life of this lasts a really, really long time. And if you're curious about why I track my sleep metrics, check out the 2021 playbook. I don't have it nearby. Oh, no, I do. It's right down here. So this is the Air Flight Pack 2. And I picked this up because I wanted a bag that could transform a little bit. And so what this has is it has backpack straps that are actually surprisingly comfortable, but they unclip and they slide into the bag. And then I can have it as in briefcase mode. So it looks like this. And it also has a shoulder strap. So it has three ways to carry. And I picked it up because I wanted a bag that I could bring on trips and I could pack it with the gear that I needed to travel with. But then simultaneously, I needed it to, to transition into a sleek looking camera bag that could have my camera in it and maybe a, a battery or something else to when I go out to dinner for TPC episodes. Because I hated showing up in like a blazer and a backpack. Like that's so weird to show up looking like that. And so I feel much more presentable when I can show up with like I'm holding a black briefcase. It doesn't look like a camera bag. There's a camera inside of it. I... In experimenting for this, I, I bought three to four other bags, and I tried them all. I bought I bought ones from Peak Design. I bought ones from Bellroy. I bought ones from who else did I buy from? It doesn't really matter. This Air Flight Pack is the best one, and this has been the favorite. It has even replaced my Peak Design everyday backpack. So I basically transition backpack straps, briefcase, shoulder strap. I, I go to meetings with this bag. Um, it's my favorite. It, it's, it's a really, really nice bag and it's super affordable compared to, you know, the $200, $300 options out there. You are looking at me standing in front of a, the next favorite, which is the combo of the fully standing desk and a hag Capisco chair. And so with the new house, I don't have to have my office be in the order in the corner of our kitchen anymore. For those that haven't been to our place, which most of you probably have not, uh, I used to have my office be in, be in our kitchen, basically. And I had a, uh, it, it was a children's desk. It's not in this office, so I can't show you. It was a desk for children, basically. That was a standing desk from Ikea. And 
the hack was that I couldn't stand at that desk for more than probably like two or three hours before I would want to like go off and do something else. And I called it like ADHD, non-productivity, whatever, but I really just wanted to sit. <laughs> and this was the hack that's here. So this is the same, um, uh, well, so the desk is a small footprint fully desk because I think that having too much desk real estate makes you a messy person. And instead of thinking, oh, well, I have to clean my desk every day, just don't give yourself the option to clutter your desk, you know? And so this gives just enough room for me to have all the peripherals that I need to record stuff. But at the same time, it doesn't, it's not so big that it's going to get messy or cluttered or have a bunch of knickknacks on it that I don't actually need. I'm not a tchotchkes on my desk type of person. And to make sure that I can sit, this is the same chair that Joe Rogan uses in his podcast studio. And so this is a chair that's designed to make your lower back do a little bit of stabilizing work. And it's designed to be able to sit in while you're standing. So like if I'm up at this height, I can raise this chair so I can kind of like rest one of my butt cheeks on it kind of thing. And, you know, continue to move around and, and get away from this sit, sitting as the new smoking kind of problem that I think a lot of people suffer with when you're a knowledge worker and you sit at a desk to do a lot of your work. The next favorite is a app called automate.io. And this favorite is more of a mental model, a way of thinking. This could be applied to Zapier. There's another service called If This Then That, or any of the kind of no code, no code algorithm creators out there where you connect different pieces of software via their API to make things happen without your input. Again, this is kind of like the the counterpoint to me saying I don't want automated systems. I do like automated systems, just not for everything. I don't need automated systems to be the only way that I make money. And since we use Notion for so much of our workflows, automate.io was acquired by Notion. And so it works really well together. But if you've never used anything to kind of like, it's just so addicting to create automations for frequently done tasks. And it's one of my favorite things in the world to do. The next piece that I really love is the computer you're watching me record this on, which is the Apple M1 MacBook Pro, M1 Pro MacBook Pro. I just geek out every single time there's a new piece of tech to be had, but this laptop is actually a game changer. It is the first time in a long time that I can remember when a piece of technology showed me that the closer we can move to the speed of our thoughts, the better. And what do I mean by that? I find frustration now thinking about the fact that after using this, typing, gestures, editing, uh, export times, everything is faster, and that makes it so that when I want to create something or add a title to a video or change a color grade, previously on my old, all my old machines, making a change to something, there's a buffer time. I'd have to wait. Same thing with like, Anything like restarting an application or making a cut in a little bit of video, there's always a lag time. With this, it, it is getting closer to moving at the speed of our thoughts, and that is immensely satisfying. It is such a joy to edit on this machine, and I could not be happier with the upgrade. A couple shows that I've been listening to, again, in line with me wanting to kind of level up in the wealth category and the personal accountability category and the owning businesses theme that you're starting to see that I'm starting trying to prioritize in my 30s. The first one being the My First Million podcast, because Sam Parr and Sean Purry have incredible synergy as hosts. Uh, I also linked Sean Purry's tweet newsletter that he publishes every week. It's basically five tweets that he really, really liked. It's a phenomenal newsletter. And I just get inspired every single time I listen to that show because they talk about growing businesses and scrappy entrepreneurs and the strategies that they use to be successful. So the My First Million podcast is really, really good. The next one is the All In podcast. And so this is basically, I think it's two billionaires and two millionaires. And they just sit around and shoot the shit about the news. So, so think about it as like, how much would it cost to sit in a room with folks who have billions of dollars of net worth and just hear them talk about stuff that's happening on Twitter or stuff that's happening in elections or stuff that, like investment decisions that they made 
and hear them like razz each other about their kids or, you know, talk about COVID or talk about memes, talk about business. That's insane that you can listen to that for free and it happens every single week. So it's the All In podcast. It's one of my favorite finds. I've gotten a couple of uh, friends obsessed with it and I look forward to it every single week. Next piece is Superhuman. So this is an app that is my favorite email client of all time. I have used multiple hacks and solution attempts to simplify email. And Superhuman is the first decision and tool that I've used that's made me stop searching. I, I don't try to optimize anymore because I have never had so many weeks of inbox zero in my life. It has completely changed how I manage my inbox. At, at one point in 2021, I had four inboxes I was managing, and it's absolutely worth $30 a month to me. The fact that I can fly through email, schedule reminders, keyboard shortcuts are fantastic. I hate using my mouse. as, as The more I can use my mouse less, the better. And it's just, it looks good, it feels good, works on mobile, works on iPad, works on desktop super, super well. Superhuman is amazing, and I would actually love for them to be a sponsor sometime in the future. A couple other fitness ones. The first one is a pair of weightlifting gloves. I don't have them here. I got a pair of palm-cushioned, open-backed gloves. They're linked in the playbook. And I, you know, full transparency, I just Googled weightlift, best weightlifting gloves on YouTube. And I watched some reviews because I have really sweaty hands. I've shared in previous playbooks that I use merino wool socks because I have really sweaty feet as well. And I would get frustrated on big lifts when my hands would be the first thing to give out, whether I'm doing pull-ups or if I'm doing a big, big deadlift or a big bench press. If I'm nervous going for big numbers, my hands sweat. And then the hands give out. It's not that my, my lats aren't strong enough to do a pull-up. It's that my hands are slippery. And so getting the, those excuses kind of removed that issue completely, and I've got zero excuses for basically increasing my strength this year. So weightlifting gloves, highly, highly recommend. The last fitness one is a pair of shoes from Nike. They're the Nike Free Run 5.0s. And when I tell you folks that for someone who has wide feet and relatively flat feet, these are the most comfortable shoes that I've ever worn, bar none, that don't require you to tie the laces. Those are the three qualifiers I look for. Is like, if they're, they're neutral colored, so I don't have to worry about them clashing with an outfit, so I got them in black on black. I don't want to tie laces every time I put them on. They need to be wide, because I have wide feet, and they need to not have too much of an arch, because I have relatively flat feet. And they, these tick all those boxes. When I found them and tried them on, I bought two pairs walking out of the store because I was like, I don't, I, I used to wear a pair of Nike um, shoes called the Commuter. They're from a line called the Commuter 2017. And they stopped making that line. And so when I saw that, I love this shoe. It's from this, a lot of similarities to the shoe that I love. I was like, I'm leaving with two pairs because once this pair gives out, I want to exactly be able to have this again. I don't want them to not stop making this anymore. It just has the right balance of minimal, but they, it, it has cushion as well. I know that I think I've shared in previous editions of this that I've been wearing the Vivo barefoot shoes as day-to-day -day shoes. Those are my gym shoes now. And so to avoid having to buy some sort of like zero drop quote unquote shoe for weightlifting. I just wear the Vivo barefoots at the gym. I walk to the gym wearing those and that I've never had any sort of uncomfortability in those. I still run in another different pair of running shoes, but for my everyday going out to dinner with friends, whatever shoe, the Nike free run 5.0s in black on black is my choice. I'm obsessed. And then the last favorite, I'm not shooting it on this now, I'm shooting this on the nice Fuji X-T4 with a mic, but for day-to-day -day Zoom calls and just overall camp webcam solution as at a desk like I have now, Camo, there's a company called Reincubate, and they have an app called Camo, I learned about this through the My First Million podcast, this completely changes how I conduct meetings every day as well as how I travel, because I don't have to bring this big camera if I'm just going away for a weekend and I have some video calls I have to do. 
the app basically allows you to use your iPhone in portrait mode as a DSLR video lookalike. And so I can put that here and it looks shockingly similar because it does the cutout thing, it blurs the background, it's so good. And so the combination of AirPods, which I also got the version three of, I have the ones that say the JK on it, those are also a favorite of mine. AirPods plus iPhone with Camo Studio on it, game changer, super, super good. And you don't have to, chances are you don't wanna be on your phone during a meeting anyways. And so it's like, why buy an extra webcam when you can just buy an app that allows your phone to do it? Anyways, that's it, folks. That has been the 2022 playbook. We actually seemed to record it without any cuts or any breaks that we had to do, which is encouraging that I can continue to hold a hold a conversation for this long. I really appreciate you for listening this far. Hopefully this is a useful add-on for the 2021 playbook. Like you should read and watch and listen to that first. It's linked down below. Then do this one because this includes a few more pieces that I'm keeping top of mind as we're starting off the new year. I hope you and yours stay healthy and happy in this year. It's just always awkward to end these articles and pieces because I don't have a call to action. I don't have anything to sell you or share with you or I don't have anything I want you to do. I don't write that much online. Maybe that'll change in 2022. But if you do, actually, here's something you should do. If you enjoy this type of content, the kind of like personal growth, hospitality, media, technology, business stuff, you should follow my newsletter. It's called the 8020 Edge. And it's basically a weekly version of some things like this. But stuff that I've found recently that I've loved from across the week, and I share my experiments I'm running, you know, in a perfect world, now that we're getting a little bit more disciplined about how we're writing that newsletter, I would love for the playbook every year to just be a, a, an amalgamation of everything that I've written about in the 8020 Edge newsletter. So if you enjoyed this, you made it all the way to the end of this, you're really going to like the newsletter because it's a more regular check-in on things that I'm enjoying, things that I've consumed, and things that I'm thinking about. So until next year, I really, really hope you folks have a good one. My name is Justin Kana. Don't forget to like and subscribe, especially if you're on the Emulsion Podcast YouTube channel. And I'll talk to you next time. Well, well, here we are again together at the end of another episode of the Emulsion Podcast. If this was your first time listening, this is a show for chefs who want to think better, increase their performance, and believe that it's possible to take lessons from what others have learned. I am your host, Justin Kana, and if you're new here, I'd like to personally welcome you to the show. It's really, really great to have you. This is a friendly reminder to check out the show notes inside of the description of this podcast if you want to check out previous guests I've had on the show, links to specifics that may have gotten brought up in this episode, and ways to find other helpful content that I create and share online. If you're still here listening, there's a pretty good chance that you're going to enjoy what I put out there because it's all focused on helping chefs and hospitality professionals perform better. If you don't have a lot of time, the best place to start is with the email newsletter that I write every single week. It's called the 8020 Edge, and there I share knowledge on sharpening your skills, asymmetric upside, that's where the 8020 comes from, and exploring the industry beyond the status quo. I say it's a great time saver because I also include all of the content in that newsletter that I publish every week, everything that I've posted on Instagram, new podcast episodes, and YouTube videos. Speaking of YouTube, you should check out the YouTube channel. There I have gear reviews of knives, spoons, pieces of equipment that I've tested, documented experiences, so going out to eat videos from some of the best restaurants in the world, and other kind of tips and tricks videos of advice that I think would be helpful for you. Lastly, if you want to learn about my intense professional development focused course, get coaching from me to help you make your next move, or support the show financially, you can check out justincona.com support to learn more, and that's greatly appreciated. Last up, and I know that other podcast hosts say it too because it really does help, is to share a review of this show on Apple Podcasts because that helps the podcast universe know that people like us like shows like this. And until the next episode, I really appreciate you spending time with me today. My name is Justin Kana, and I hope you have a good one.